Hello cave dwellers, there exists a place I call the Magic Dumpster. I walk past it most days on my way to and from my car at work, and if I'm magic, amazing gifts seem to be waiting for me. And this latest find is no exception. Sitting atop a pile of rubbish, can you believe it, was this outstanding looking 486 PC. And I unashamedly dove in and took it home with me. The IPC branded desktop case here sports a 3.5 inch floppy disk drive and on the rear here you can see we've got the standard power input and power pass through for a monitor, a 5 pin DIN keyboard socket and no less than 8 expansion slots which we'll take a closer look at now. The previous owner has chosen to label up some of these ports. From left to right there's a network card which sports not only an RJ45 port but also a DB15 connector and a BNC coaxial connector. So this could connect to most network types of the time. Another DB15 port is labelled as the game port, as well as 25 and 9 pin serial ports and a regular parallel port which would have been used mostly for printers at the time. Last but not least we have a video adapter card and I'll be very interested to see what that is. We'll see what lies inside the case shortly but this is shown as a Valium Magic 486-CV model. And the dumpster also handily gave us an IPC branded keyboard to go alongside it. It all looks very nice, but there must be a reason it was in the dumpster, so let's crack open the case and see what we can find inside. It's always a good idea to do this before switching on a find, just to check that there are no leaky capacitors, batteries or other damage that might cause harm to you or more harm to the device itself if you don't check it out first. Just three screws were required to get this case open, uh, and then we slide it forward and we can take a look inside. The first thing you'll notice is that there's a little bit of dust, but not so much considering the age of the machine, and that's because this is a passively cooled system. The only fan is in the PSU. Here's the hard drive, which would appear to be um, of the period. It's a Connor CFS 540A, and that gives us a whopping 540 megabyte capacity. Less than that of a single CD-ROM. Let's work through these expansion cards. The first one is fitted into this very long looking ISA slot. It's the video adapter, and that slot is a VESA local bus, which is a short lived expansion slot. Which means this card is something quite special. The name of it rolls off the tongue it's a Trident TGUI9400CXI. It's a 1 megabyte card with an uh, expansion capacity to 2 megabytes, came out in 1993, and it's a 32 bit card which is just begging to be tested with SimCity 2000. So I'm looking forward to putting that through its paces. Let's take a look at the next card in the system. This is also in the Vesa bus expansion slot. It takes up two slots in the system here, one for the card and one for two additional ports which mount on the back plate there. And this is a card of many talents indeed. It acts as a floppy disk controller, hard drive controller, uh, and it also manages the serial, parallel and game ports in the system all of which I need to disconnect before I can pull the card out here which is slightly reluctant to come out but uh, with a little bit of teasing out it comes and we can take a closer look. So the card is what's known as a VLB IO controller which is built around Goldstar's custom Prime 2C chip set. This includes the Goldstar GM82C711 chip located at the IDE port. Settings can be managed with the array of dip switches here but as we have a single master drive I don't think any changes need to be made. At least I hope not. And the Goldstar GD75232 chips here, managing the sending and receiving of data on the RS232 port. Let's dig a little deeper, shall we, and see what else we've got in here. The next card is a real business favourite and quite the workhorse. It pops out without any fuss, it's mounted in a standard ISA slot, and this is a 3Com Etherlink 3 card from 1994. The model and revision number is written in pen on the card here uh, and the board is mostly taken up by this 3COM parallel task in controller chip. There's also a slot for an optional boot ROM and as we saw earlier the three different methods of connecting to a network, coax, RJ45 or the DB15 port. So those are all the expansion cards that are in the machine. I'm pretty pleased with that and there's plenty of space for additional cards. We'll pop the RAM modules out now and see what we've got here. There's three modules in total. Uh, we've got a double-sided module here and two single-sided modules. They're occupying three out of the four available slots. And they appear to be mixed manufacturer's modules with these little HM514400BS7 chips uh, indicating that this is a Hitachi RAM module. And then we've got Toshiba chips uh, on the other modules. So um, I've totted it up and it looks like we've got 16 megabytes of RAM here, which is a lot for the time really. So to recap so far, we've had the Trident video adapter, 
the Gold Star IO card, 3 COM network card and uh, 16 meg of RAM. A sound card really the only absent thing here should we want to do some gaming. But what of the CPU? What kind of power do we have in this thing? Well I was surprised to find a slightly offbeat Intel CPU here. It was an Intel Overdrive chip. We'll take a quick tour of the motherboard and then we'll come back to that chip. The chipset here is an SIS 85C471 chipset. We have a generous 3 VESA local bus slots, 3 16-bit ISA slots and the shorter 8-bit ISA slot. As far as damage or danger from capacitors is concerned, everything looks good. The backup battery here checks out just fine and the award BIOS sits happily on this chip here. The magic of crystals gives this PC its heartbeat at 14.31818 MHz. And the L2 cache which is commonly found on the CPU these days is located on the motherboard with empty slots for expansion if required. This board seems to support a variety of CPU types by adjusting jumpers from a 486DX, uh, an SX, an M7, an AMD SL uh, and what we have here, an overdrive which appears to be the most powerful chip supported. So let's talk about the overdrive chip. Overdrive was Intel's branding for a range of processors designed to squeeze a bit more life out of aging hardware, given the performance of a modern processor with the backward compatibility to work with an older motherboard. The Overdrive range was eventually retired as Intel felt it was damaging sales of their newer processors. This particular chip is a DX4 100MHz chip, initially available only as an Overdrive processor but eventually released as a 486 processor in its own right. Competition also played a part in this decision, with upgrade options such as this Cyrix Maths coprocessor, which you could fit alongside an existing CPU to increase performance. Or like the Overdrive, this Cyrex processor which was a straight replacement for an Intel processor, offering big performance gains at a fraction of Intel's cost. And if Cyrex is a name unfamiliar to you, they're now known as AMD. Before I found this dumpster PC, my ideal vintage PC would have been 486DX266. So this overdrive CPU will do just the job, giving both power and compatibility. I'm looking forward to putting everything back together now and powering it up to see what happens. I've also tried to do some research on this IPC brand and I haven't been able to find much outside of French markets and commercials in French publications. My guess is perhaps that they used some end of line parts, boosted it with the overdrive processor and sold it as a slightly budget power system. At a time when premium PCs accommodated those early Pentium CPUs. There was a monitor with the PC but sadly it doesn't work. Given the dangers of opening old CRT monitors and the charge that they hold, I won't be going into that today. Without training I'd advise you not to either. So for testing we'll fall back onto an LCD. Let's lower the volume of the music now and fire it up and see what happens. Sweet whirring fans and clicky hard drives, the dumpster PC actually works. The CPU is correctly identified, we're seeing 12 instead of 16 megs of RAM, a floppy drive failure is reported and the hard disk is correctly identified at 541 megabytes. There's very little on the hard drive, just some hardware diagnostics and calibration tools by the looks of it, for use with specialist devices connected on the serial port. That Trident video card is correctly detected with a whopping 1 meg of onboard RAM. An F-Disk shows us that there's just a single partition set up in a FAT16 file system format. The floppy drive and RAM I'll look into. The case needs a clean up. But on the whole I'm amazed that this works and it's the perfect foundation for the retro PC I've always wanted on my desk. With a sound card and a CD-ROM drive from the period, you're going to see a lot more of this on my channel. If you'd like to see future upgrades, if you enjoyed this video, or if you'd like to see similar content, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe and come back soon for more Cave Dwellers. Take care.